This is our second video on molecular spectroscopy. Today we're going to concentrate on the information we obtained from the area of the visible light, ultraviolet, and the x-rays. Today we're going to be... Uh, Today we're going to continue our study of molecular spectroscopy, but we're going to continue our study and look at the area of visible light, ultraviolet, and x-rays and information we get from those areas, mostly concentrating on ultraviolet. Electronic spectroscopy is the area uh, that deals with the visible light, and it includes non-ionizing radiation. Now this is radiation that does not, uh, this is a lowest energy, and this is the, uh, the using light. Um, Non-ionizing non means that there are no electrons removed, so electrons will not be removed from this. Um, this, is, this will tell us information about the outer valence electrons. Uh, when this visible light is added, the electrons will vibrate between the energy levels, so it will tell us a, bit, a little bit about the surface phenomenon. Um, a few things about this, uh, like I said, no electrons are removed. But it will tell us something about the bonds. We have conjugate double bonds. Conjugate means every other bond is a double bond, and so that's why we call it a conjugate double bond. Uh, the, what we're going to be looking at here is with uh, beta carotene, which is in carrots. And a couple things. This is a, it's important transition metal cations. I think most of you learned as a d orbital as one level, but the d's are actually sp as split. If we think of there's a 3D, there's a, and there's another 3D. I drew that as a crooked line, but let's think of it as a straight line. Um, and this is only true for ions where there are empty orbitals. So this would not apply to zinc. If you do an electron configuration for zinc, there are no empty orbitals. That's why zinc is a colorless solution. Any solutions that are colored have empty orbitals. The reason being because those electrons can absorb energy, jump up from one d orbital to the next, and then fall back down very easily, and that gives it a characteristic color. So they absorb energy, jump up to high energy, high energy level, the 1D, and they fall back down to the other D. That's called the splitting of the D orbitals. That's why we have a gray color for cobalt. That's why the, uh, the cobalt has that nice pink color. That's why the, the green color we see in the nickel solutions. Uh, so that, that provides a color we see in those solutions. Uh, here's what a spectrum like that would look like. For example, we looked at beta carotene. That's what's in carrots. That's what gives them their very orange color. Um, so we look at the spectrum, and we know visible light we see goes between 400 and 750 nanometers. So it goes from the area of 400 to about 750, which is about right here. And so this would be the red portion of the spectrum. So red, orange, yellow and green, and then we get over to the 400, that's going to be our violet region. Um, and then here would be our indiglo and our blue. So there's our Roy G. Biv. What you notice here is uh, there's a great deal of absorbance at the 450 region. That's where, and that's actually in the, in the blue region. Now notice that is not the orange region, region. It absorbs in the blue regions, and so what happens it releases a complementary to color or it transmits an orange. So the absorbance we should see should be uh, the complementary color uh, which we, the color that we see, what's absorbed should be the complementary color. Going to the next slide. So now let's look at a little bit higher energy and this will actually tell us more information when we use ultraviolet uh, or electron transmissions. Now this is also called ionizing radiation because you actually knock out an electron. Uh, another name for it, and the name that we'll see the most often, is photoelectric spectroscopy, or PEZ. So these are both names for this process. Uh, actually, someone uh, won a Nobel Prize for this. His name was spelled S-I-E-G-B-A-H-N in 1981. He actually started working with this in 1957, and it told us, told us a great information about core electrons, which we had not known before. Um, so what happens with enough energy, you can actually remove an electron from the atom. And what we're trying to drive home here is when you find information out about the electrons or the structure, what you're using is the same energy that's in that particle. 
And so what they're doing is there's a lot higher energy when you get these electrons that are in the atom. And so there, there's, that's why they're using much higher energy here. Remember that as you decrease a wavelength, you increase the frequency and likewise increase the energy. Um, so this graph, one thing to notice is it's not to scale. We go 0 and then it goes 5.31 or it goes to 0 to 10. And beloved, it's above that it's 10 to 0, then 100 to 500. So this is uh, definitely not to scale. And another thing to notice is the units for this are called electron volts. Um, and that's just a unit of energy, how much energy was put in. But as we go to the right, we're increasing energy, which means we're decreasing the wavelength and we're increasing the frequency of that ultraviolet light that we're adding to it. Uh, now what we're looking at specifically here is magnesium and we know magnesium has 12 electrons. Usually when we see this configuration we see the mass there and we don't see the atomic, uh, the atomic number or the number of protons there but that's the way this is, is uh, presented in this, uh, in this reading. Um, what we see here is uh, there is uh, Right here we, is the first place that energy was applied. Uh, so we had 0.74 volts and two electrons were emitted or ejected. So what happens, a certain amount of energy was put in and so they inserted uh, UV radiation was added to this and then two electrons were actually e ejected from this um, and that, with that amount of energy. And then they increased the amount of energy and when they got up to 0.5, 5.31, they actually uh, ejected six electrons. Um, and then notice as they go further to 9.07 electron volts, two more electrons were ejected. And notice prior to that it was six. And they increased the voltage even more, going from 10 to 100. Then they passed 100 up to 126 electron volts and two more electrons were uh, ejected. So this accounts for all 12 electrons that we see that are in the magnesium um, atom. So, and note, remember once that this, this is not to scale. So let's interpret this a little bit differently. Well, first we want to review the electron configuration for magnesium. Remember it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Remember these are all what we call core electrons. And this, the 3s, is a valence electron. Any that time you have the highest number, that's considered valence. The, so with, if we want to think about what electrons are experiencing the greatest pull from the nucleus, the electrons right here are really close to the nucleus. So if we think of the, of the nucleus as being positive, and we have, this would represent 1s, and then we have 2s, and that would be 2p, because as the number increases, that tells us distance from the nucleus, so 2s and 2p are both about the same distance from the nucleus. And then we have the 3s. So the electrons that are experiencing the greatest pull should be the 1s, because those are very close to the nucleus. And then the 2s and 2p would be next. And the least pull should be the 3s, because at, at energy level 3, those are furthest from the nucleus. In addition, they're experiencing shielding from all those other electrons. So there's two factors coming into play here that make these electrons easy to remove. One is the idea of shielding. Uh, it's shielded by all those core electrons. Two is the idea of distance. That electron is further away from that positive, that negative electron is further away from that positive nucleus than any of the other electrons. And for that, ease, for that reason, those two electrons are the easiest to remove. So with that understanding in, in mind, let's look at the next graph and it should make a little bit more sense to us. Okay, a couple of things we want to be able to answer from this graph, from this graph, and what I've done this time is the graph has all been put onto one scale, and, and so that make, make it a little easier to read. Now, it's, I said it's put on one line, it still is not to scale. Notice we go from 0 to 10, and we have almost equal distance between 10 and 100, and then almost a 500, so it's definitely not to scale. But let's see if we can run through these questions. Which peak in the spectrum represents electrons closest to the nucleus? So we want to go back to this previous slide, and we see the ones with the closest to the nucleus would require the most energy. So we want to go back to this and think which would require the most energy, and we would think these right here would be our 1s, our 1s2 electrons. So those would be the ones that are closest to the nucleus. The next question, so we've answered that question. Next question, what is the relevance 
of the relative height of the peak at 5.31 and 9.07. So what we see is this peak is higher. That indicates there's more electrons. That's why we say there's six electrons e ejected from that peak. So at that point, that would tell us that would, if we go back to electron configuration, that would indicate that that would be the 2p or the 2p sublevel that contains six electrons. So that's what would happen at that. Uh, the next one, why is there such a large difference between the energy between the peak at 126 volts, which we see there, and the other peaks? Well, one thing we can tell about that, these are the core and the electrons that are closest to the nucleus. And so they're going to have the greatest pull of anything else. And notice the amount of, of, of energy that was applied was 126 electron volts compared to 0.74. Huge difference. So that's the highest energy. It means there's more binding energy, and they're much closer to the nucleus, uh, as opposed to these electrons right here, which are further away. Uh, the other thing we might want to do is go through and identify all these electrons. So we're basically working backwards because uh, the ones that require the most energy are the ones that be we begin with first. So the lowest energy level require the mo highest energy removed, so that's 1s2. Then this would be 2s2. And next would be 2p6. And then we'd have 3s2. Let's go make sure through, uh, through and make sure we've answered all these questions. Uh, next one, using PES spectrum, predict the full electron configuration of this atom. We just did that. Excellent. Assuming the PES data show that all the electrons present in an atom identify the element. What you simply need to do is use the height of the peaks, or if the electrons are provided, look at that. We can see there's 2 plus 2 plus 6 plus 2. That will give us 12 electrons. And we're, this is a neutral particle, so the electrons are equal to the number of protons, so there's 12 protons, and so the identity would, of course, be magnesium. Read through, as you do this also, A7.4 in your textbook, and that will give you a lot more information about this as well, and we're going to be doing a, a, a lab with spectrometry but, spectrometry, but, of course, the visible light spectrum this week. If you have any questions, be sure and let me know. Thank you.